we hoped it might serve this wider community to host a conversation today with Chirp's blessing, an opportunity for you to get more direct answers to some of your important questions, and together to increase our pool of shared knowledge, if not necessarily our complete agreement. Frank will be speaking and sharing to give us a baseline of understanding and awareness. He'll seek to address the most common questions and shed light on the most common concerns that have arisen so far. And then we'll open up the conversation for your as yet unanswered questions. For those who are on Zoom, we invite you to type your questions into the chat and Beth Carroll, who's there online with you, will help cur curate those and collect those. And if you're here in the room, we'll invite you, especially if you're a person who benefits from putting something in writing, to write them on some cards. Eileen has cards here, so that we can get the most questions possible answered in our time together. And then we'll see how the feel goes when we come to that Q&A time to decide how we do that. We'll collect them, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible, and then we'll end by five o'clock. For those who are new to the building, it may help you to know that the restrooms are right down the hall. And on your way, on the right in the library, you'll see the current display selections from the Visibility Through Art Project in the library. It's been up for a couple months now. And with gratitude, I'm going to turn it over to Frank Lawrence. And Frank invites you to tell us what you would like us to know about yourself. Thanks, Kevin. Welcome, Saxon. <laughs> Tribal Council member just walked in. And Eileen Hale is the chair of our Nissanon Task Force, who's handing out question cards. And I know Carmen Riley's here and Anita Wald Tuttle. So there are a few members of our task force here. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'll give you a short introduction. Um, uh, I've been a member of UUCM here for over 20 years. Uh, my parents also were members. They're on the memorial tree in the back, along with my in laws. Um, and I'm in my 35th year of practice as a lawyer in California, and my practice has been exclusively um, representing federally recognized Indian tribes for the last 35 years. Uh, Nevada City Ranchery is the first um, non-federally recognized tribe that I've worked with, and I've been working with them for about four and a half years now uh, on a pro bono basis. Um, I think that's all you need to know about me. And Paul, if you would queue up the video, Chirp um, just released a video yesterday on YouTube uh, that we're going to take uh, about seven minutes to watch. And then I will, as Kevin promised, sort of get into the frequently asked questions. So if, if you could queue that up, Paul, that'd be great. <laughs> I'm Shelley Covert. I'm the spokesperson for the Nevada City Ranchery and Nisenan Tribe. We are the tribe that was located here in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Our history here is incredibly long. We have archaeological sites that date back 9,000 to 11,000 years here very locally. Gold was discovered in Nisenan territory. So our families somehow exist here through all the violence and misfortune that happened um, after the gold rush. My grandfather, he was one of the 18 that survived what you can call the Holocaust or genocide or extermination. They all fit. They tried to exterminate our people. We're here today, uh, even though we're sort of ghosts in our homeland, uh, without federal recognition. A lot of times history has left us out of the history books and we're not reflected out there in the community where we can see ourselves and where our community can see us as a key component of our landscape where we are today. We have little clusters of uh, tribal members, but as far as it goes for the major community of all the tribal members, uh, it's extremely difficult without a central place to gather.
what I keep hearing is this key point that keeps reverberating no matter what generation it is, is the need to be together. We need a place that we can call our own, where we can gather. And I, I do believe that, that that's born from the land itself around us. I think the land wants us back and we need the land in so many ways. And so many times the community, which is wonderful, will call and say, oh, the land's calling, will you come visit? And so we go out and we visit and it's wonderful and it's beautiful but then we have to shake hands and say thank you and leave. It's like our home, but we're not welcome there. We are at an ancient village site, Yulicha, one of the villages that swore allegiance to the Nevada City Rancheria. The woman folks who ran this land for a very long time and were the stewards here, they were very, very interested in some kind of land rematriation, like land back movement. Um, they also have their own debts and responsibilities that they have to tie up, which they may have the heart and they wish they could just hand it over to us, but that is not the case. And that's why there's this dollar amount attached to the land. It ticks so many boxes. There's already built structures here. There's space to spread out. The water is right there. The ravens, the hawks, the mountain lion we saw when we were out here last time. There's so much open space here and so many activities we can do and so many culture practices that we can actually bring back to this landscape. So we can do fire practices, we can do cutting practices, stump painting practices, and pulling practices. So we actually have a chance to take a little bubble here and showcase it to the rest of the county of what actually works and what doesn't work, but we can do it from a cultural stance. There's not enough housing here to house the entire tribe, but some people are living in sheds with no heat, no running water, raising kids in these environments. There's enough space here to bring them in and at the very least get them housed immediately. There is a commercial kitchen. We have youth in our tribe that want to be chefs. I think the other really big thing is the access to the cultural resources that are on site here that are somehow still remain. So there's a medicine rock up on the hill and a ceremonial spot. Medicine rock is amazing and I think that's another place that our children need to go and we need to touch and feel our ancestors that were there and what they used it for. Just those few things are already incredible reasons that this land would tick off those boxes that stabilizes us into the future. One thing that can be created with obtaining a, a precious piece of land is that we can bring back that community feeling and all of us can gather and talk and educate the young so they know and can be proud of who we were and who we are now today as one, the Nishinon Nation, the Northern Foothill Nishinon. The biggest thing, the most desperate moment right now is that we have a very short window to raise a whole bunch of money. The $2.4 million that we want to raise to purchase the land, to pay for any of the government and service fees that have to be paid, to do the necessary things that have to be in place on the land for it to be a viable opportunity for us to use the land, and then to raise also an endowment to move forward. We're short. Our people are poor. You know, we do not have any resources really available. We live from paycheck to paycheck, and sometimes those paychecks are rather small. If you're able to support our GoFundMe campaign, thank you very much. If you're unable to give funds, that's perfectly okay too. Not all of us have the funds to give to something like this, but you can share it. If you find our story, our history moving and want us to see us to take the next step to reclaiming some of our culture, share it with your own communities. When I'm home, me, it does my heart good um, that people care and that they support us and I truly appreciate it and I hope that we can give more back. I think that's a big part of us. It's not how much we hold and what we have, it's how much we give.
I think we're there. <laughs> um, yeah, yay. <laughs> Beautifully done. And we're tell, uh, Kit, 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 Kit Kohler, Riparian, Riparian Studios, and Ellie McCutcheon, a, a contract. Pro, pro, bono, pro bono video editing magic um, put this together. So just remarkable. Um, so I think uh, the first thing I was going to just go over quickly was sort of the background of this homeland return. People want to know how did this happen. Um, there were, I think there were conversations in years past between CHIRP and the Nisenan tribe and Woolman before I was involved. My first um, uh, exposure to this was a phone call from a Woolman board member in, I think, June maybe of last year asking is this possible how would this work can an indian tribe hold title to land the board's thinking of, of selling this land so that's where it started we entered into conversations in september i think pretty seriously the woman board asked chirp to prepare a letter of intent a non-binding letter of intent that would sort of set out what the terms and the timeline and the process would be um, and really emphasized to CHIRP that time was of the essence for the woman board. Um, they've closed all their programs, they've run out of fundraising options, and they've made the decision to wind down the operations there and to sell the land. And every month that they keep the land, they incur costs, um, presumably insurance, taxes. They've let all their staff go except for a, one interim executive director. Um, so they've pared their costs down to the bare minimum, but the clock's ticking. So the sense of urgency in terms of the time frame, we are way past what the Woolman board was hoping for. They were hoping to reach an agreement and close escrow in 30 days. Um, yeah, and so uh, that's where we started. It took us a month to negotiate the letter of intent. <laughs> and then... Um, uh, then we started negotiating a purchase and sale agreement, and we went back and forth through realtors the way that you do when you sell property in this country in this day and age. And, um, you know, uh, fairly early on in that process, the Woolman Board learned that they need um, some government approval to sell. The uh, Woolman is, is College Park Friends Educational Association. It's a California uh, public benefit corporation. 501c3, and CHIRP is, the, is also a California public benefit nonprofit corporation, 501c3. Um, California, in exchange for the tax benefits of chartering a nonprofit corporation, if that corporation goes to sell its primary asset or most of its assets or all of its assets, um, the state wants to take a look at the transaction and make sure that the public benefit is still being met. Um, so uh, until that happens, um, Woolman doesn't even really have the legal ability to sell the land. And so that's in process. Um, they've made their application and the AG's office, the state attorney general's office that reviews, they have a division that reviews this or an office that reviews these kinds of transactions. They've come back with some follow-up questions and Woolman's in the process of responding. So we negotiated a purchase and sale agreement. We got executed and an escrow was opened January the 8th. And um, we, we have identified April 4th as our Fisher cut bait uh, date to raise the money. That's also the time frame in the contract for CHIRP to do all of its due diligence and investigations. Um, and there's a lot to be done in that area. So we're in the middle of that process. Um, CHIRP has met with the county twice so far, uh, which it has um, regulatory jurisdiction over the land. It's unincorporated Nevada County land. So I think maybe that's enough on the background. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say is that it's really, like I've lived here for 25 years in this community. And I've known about the John Woolman School all this time. I've heard about it. My kids went to um, 
Yuba River Charter, Yuba River Charter School down on Bitney Springs at, the, at that um, old campus. So we drove by Jones Bar Road a lot for many years uh, and been aware of it. And I've known people that have lived there. Our former musical director here at UUCM, Jordan Thomas Rose, lived there for a while with his partner. Um, Sierra Streams Institute, which is a former pro bono client of mine locally, had its offices there that burned in the fire, in the Jones fire. But what's really become striking to me, what's really become clear, as many of you know that are here, is how deep the connection is that people who have been affiliated with the John Woolman School, how deep that connection is. It's really profound. And I, maybe because I'm more conscious of it because of this opportunity, I, I keep meeting alumni all over town. <laughs> and I met one of my neighbors uh, today who's here uh, who I just found out today is an alum. So um, the connections are really, really deep and profound. And I think that um, part of the dynamic that's going on is a real sense of loss and a real sense of grief that people, people for whom John Woolman has been a central part of their life, say, people have said it saved my life. It, you know, it, it, it has had a profound effect on people. And the thought of it not, no longer being the John Woolman School there is a huge loss. And people are really, really grieving. And um, I see that. And, and Chirp sees it, and the tribe sees it. It's something that we've talked a lot about. Um, there's a book, The Woolman Way, A History of the John Woolman School by Catherine Lennox and Lisa Frankel. Lisa's local. I don't know Catherine. I know Lisa. And um, I, can, I, know, I know Lisa, and I know that the book is fantastic. Um, she's a historian, among other things, and she had access to all of the archives at Woolman and realized that there's an incredible story that needs to be told. So I would encourage everybody to seek that book out. Um, when I talked to Lisa this week, she said Harmony Books has had it in the past. They were sold out. They're ordering more. So you can get it locally at Harmony, but it's also you can get it at Barnes & Noble online or Amazon. Um, so I would encourage people to, um, to check that out. OK, frequently asked questions. I have received questions <laughs> from left, right, center, behind, above, below. Uh, as we've been going through this. And uh, after a while, you start to see themes emerging. So I thought what I would do was kind of hit those themes um, and give you my thoughts about how I think about those questions. Um, and then as Kevin said, we'll kind of open it up and Kevin will sort of collect questions that you've written, people have asked on Zoom and, and we'll use the rest of our time to, to, to try to answer those. So, and I'll just say, you know, what I'm saying is, is my view, is my knowledge, is my perspective. And I don't have uh, a lock on the truth or ultimate reality. We all see things our own way. So um, I just want to give that disclaimer. Okay, the first question, what does CHIRP intend to do with the property? That's a great question. Uh, probably not have a Quaker boarding school. I'm going to guess. <laughs> um, you know, for those of you who know, boarding schools in Indian country, it's, it's kind of a touchy subject. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it's just, so that's probably not happening. And as Shelley said in the video, um, you know, right at the top of the list is housing, uh, particularly for tribal elders and for some tribal members who are living in uninhabitable uh, conditions, really. Um, when we, we did a tour of the property, and walked through all the buildings. We went through the tool shed. Those of you that have been out there that know the tool shed at Woolman, you can see daylight between the wall and the roof, right? And I, is it a dirt floor, Dean? I'm not sure. It, it, it does not, but it's, it, 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 it's sort of concrete and you know, it's, a, it's a shop, it's a tool shed, it's funky. And you know, Shelly's comment when we were walking through, I didn't get your permission to say this, but Shelly commented under her breath, but I heard her, this would be an improvement in housing for, for some of the tribal members. So you, that's an important baseline to keep in mind. So some housing. Um, there are single family residences, res, residences out there that have tenants in them. 
Um, Dean Olson, an elder, is, is one of those. And uh, the woman board, before we met Dean, the woman board asked Chirp if it would be all right if Dean stayed uh, after the close of escrow. And Chirp said, of course. So Dean, Dean will be staying. <laughs> um, but there, there are other options there for housing. And so that's a hope. That's a dream. Um, you saw in the video the Medicine Rock. It I've been there. It's it is a power spot. It really, really is. It's an amazing um, cultural resource. Um, I think um, in some of the materials that Chirps generated on the web, in brainstorming, what are the possibilities? You'll see some of that. That's brainstorming. That's wish list. That's what if maybe we could, but. The reality is that the, the property is zoned agricultural by the county. And so the county is really going to have the final say about what activity is permitted out there. Um, Woman's operated under a conditional use permit for about the last 20 years. Almost everything that Woman has ever done on the property is not permitted by the zoning of the land. The school, you know, the ceramic studio and classes, uh, the uh, commercial composting business that's there now. Um, the only thing that is consistent with the zoning is the farm. There's Bluebird Farm. They have a tenant farmer on the land. Um, that's what it's zoned for. So if you want to do things on land that is not permitted by the zoning, you can do it by getting a conditional use permit. And that's how Woolman is operated. But the purposes of that are not what Chirp would want to do. Like I said, I, it, I, what, I was sort of kidding, but not really kidding. They're not going to have a boarding school. Woolman had, you know, dorm rooms for, I think, up to 100 students and up to 35 faculty. The number of people that Chirp is thinking will be out there is much, much less than that. And it's really what folks were talking about in the video. Uh, the, their hope is just to have a place where the elders can share meals together, they can be together, and the youth can come out and learn from the elders. That's my sense of the dream. But it, you know, the county is going to have a big say in what they can do. Um, really frequent question I've gotten: Does Chirp have the capacity to handle the property? You know, how will Chirp afford to maintain the property when Woolman has struggled, and so on? And there are answers to those questions. Uh, CHIRP, because it's a tribally directed nonprofit, has the ability to get grants and do fundraising from sources that were not available to Woolman. So it's just a completely different model. Woolman tried to make it by balancing income generated on the land, tuition from students and so on, with their expenses. And that was a tough balancing act for them to maintain. Um, that's, not, that's not the model I see CHIRP adopting here. I see CHIRP adopting a completely different model. They have grant funding for staff. They have grant funding for meeting space. Today, that money would be available to cover insurance taxes, you know, those kind of operating expenses. So a very different um, I think financial picture that I'm seeing from where I stand. Um, I, I also want to say that I, the question comes from a good place, right? It comes from a place of caring about the land that people ask that question. But I think it's important to think when you ask that question, how, what message is that sending to CHIRP and to the tribe? when that question gets asked, right? Um, I want to read a letter. A member of our congregation here at UUCM um, wrote a letter that was published yesterday in the Union. And I just want to read it to you. It's just four paragraphs. Recently, several presumably Anglo writers to the Union have shared with us their deep personal attachment to the land outside Nevada City that was once the John Woolman School campus, land that the local Nisanon hoped to purchase. In our hypermobile culture, the sense of place expressed by those authors deserves our respect. Although the John Woolman School property is not that close to my own heart, 
there are other places I deeply treasure. It's clear to me that such cherishing of special geography is not to be taken lightly. And a great deal of turf in North America was acquired by conquest and, alas, genocide. Although I didn't do that, I can't deny that my forebearers did and that I have benefited from their actions. If the Nisanan yearn to restore a piece of their heritage, I'm not sure it's fair for the rest of us to say, yes, if dot dot dot. It's admirable to care about the future of that property. It's wise to value open space. It's appropriate to encourage thoughtful, if any, development. But it may be that we non Nisanan folks long ago forfeited the moral high ground in such a discussion, Inclu including the right to demand that our preferences have priority. Let us instead wholeheartedly support the Nisanan in reclaiming part of their stolen treasure. Let us acknowledge their ancient sense of stewardship. Rather than demanding limits on their ownership, let us restore as best we can their ancient right to use it as they think wise. Scotty Hart. So I feel the love that the alumni and staff of the Woman School have for the land and the deep investment, financial, spiritual, emotional, political, environmental, <laughs> on every level. I, I feel it. And many of you in this room have helped me to understand that. And I appreciate that. I'm grateful for that. And I think we can hold that. And we can also hold the sentiment that Scotty's letter expresses. We, we, we can work to try to hold all of that perspective. So um, those are some thoughts on that question. All right, moving on. Can there be a conservation easement put on the land to protect it from future development. We're worried about, I'm worried about future development. We're worried about it. How do we guarantee that no additional development will ever occur on the land? Um, again, this comes, these questions come from a place of deep caring and deep love. And again, try to imagine the message that that sends to Chirp and to the Nisanan tribe. What is it saying to them? I, I, will, I will note that Woolman as an institution over the years has sold off parcels of land when they needed to to raise money for private development, private homes. Um, I've met with all the neighbors on Woolman Lane and they're wonderful people and they're supportive of this land transition. I'll just mention as a footnote. <laughs> um, and I'll also mention that um, Dorothy and Doug Henderson live in the last house on the left before you get to the property. Uh, Dorothy, I think, was a former head of school. Uh, Doug was on the facilities committee for 15 years. They still live there. And they are so eager to help chirp transition and understand the facilities and how things work and what the history is. Um, But there's a piece of these kinds of questions about conservation easement. Oh, so woman sold off land. Woman is operate, you know, has has a tenant farmer, a commercial for profit farm on the property, and has for the last couple of years. They have a commercial for profit, com commercial scale composting business on the property. There's, as you all probably know, there's a ceramic studio with a beautiful Japanese climbing kiln that um, that I've now seen uh, with my own eyes. There's all kinds of things going on out there. There's been a lot of development on the land already. And what I can tell you is that Chirp's vision from everything I understand and see is a lower impact kind of um, place on the land, not more development, probably less development. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of maintenance. There's a lot of retrofitting that needs to happen on some of those buildings. But um, 
So, but also, again, back to that question, what message does it send to the tribe to say, wait a minute, uh, can we, why don't you put a conservation e easement on the land and stop any development? What does it say? What, what message gets received by that? Like, how, do, how does that sound if you're on the receiving end of that? Um, uh, Woolman, as an institution, was in conversation with the Bear Yuba Land Trust for a number of years about the idea of putting a conservation easement on the land. And we've met with the Bear Yuba Land Trust. We met with their whole board and their staff. They had a whole bunch of questions. They were interested. Um, and we had a, a, a long meeting with them. Um, my understanding is that Bear Yuba Land Trust told the Woolman Board that there's been far too much development on the land to make it appropriate for a conservation easement. So the question is not to chirp, why won't you put a conservation easement on it? Maybe the question is to the Woolman School 30 years ago, <laughs> There were, you know, the conservation easement movement is relatively recent uh, in my experience, and uh, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It's like, uh, well, I won't go down. Uh, there was a tangent that occurred to me, but um, I will say that Sierra Streams Institute has a grant from the California Wildlife Conservation Board to implement a forest management program, and Sierra Streams Institute is collaborating with CHIRP on that now they've sought input and review and they're um, implementing that forest management plan and um, chirps uh, view my my sense of chirps view is is that that they, they would welcome uh, sierra streams institute's continued assistance in restoring the forest to health particularly after the fire um, okay is chirp going to build an indian casino on the land i know you're all dying to ask that question um, no, <laughs> the short answer is no. Uh, um, CHIRP is, like I said, a California public benefit nonprofit corporation. It does not have a legal right to build and operate a casino. The Nevada City Rancher and Nissan tribe is not federally recognized. It does not have a legal right. But what if they get federally recognized? Okay, then CHIRP, you know. So we got tired. I got tired of answering this question. And I mean, I can walk you through the statute. I know it well, but that's not what's happening here. But I got tired of the question. And so I said to the CHIRP board, I would like CHIRP to ask Woolman to amend the sale contract to make a requirement be part of the sale and purchase that there would never be a casino on the land in perpetuity. And that we do that by recording a deed restriction in the chain of title that will bind all future landowners, including the United States of America. If, it, if the tribe ever got federally recognized, and if CHIRP ever sold the land to the, to the tribe, and if the tribe then applied to the federal government to take it into trust, and then the federal government approved that, these are, each of these is many years, you understand, right? Um, yeah. the, yeah, right. We've yeah, the tribe's only been after federal recognition since 1964, basically. So uh, uh, that deed restriction runs with the land, and it binds the United States of America. Okay, so and I have a copy here of the recorded deed restriction for anybody who want who doesn't believe me and wants to see it with your own eyes. Any, it's online. Oh, it's online. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, I was gonna. Oh, I meant to do that. Um, so uh, I hope we have, there's so many real questions and there's so much real work to do. I hope that puts it to rest. That was my hope. The Woolman board thanked us for the ask. They said, we, we thought it would be disrespectful to ask CHIRP, which I thought was to their credit, um, but they were really relieved and delighted that CHIRP asked the Woolman board to do this. So that's, it's done, finito. Um, CHIRP's website has a recently um, updated page on the homeland return that includes a frequently asked question list, which are slightly different than my list, 
but I thought I'd read it to you really quickly. Does the Nevada City Rancheria tribe intend to expand or change the land use permit at Woolman? Is the current land use permit at Woolman up to code and compliance? Will the tribe put a conservation easement on the Woolman property? Does the Nevada City Rancheria tribe intend to build an Indian gaming casino at Woolman? Does the Nevada City Rancheria tribe and CHIRP have other lands they've stewarded? Why are the friends, the, the Quakers, selling Woolman at this price? What happens to the Woolman land should the sale to CHIRP fall through? What happens to the donated money should the sale of the woman uh, fall through? They have answers to all those questions on their website. So I will point you there. <laughs> um, they're all good questions, I think. Um, and they're questions that I've heard. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I'd like to address a difficult issue. Uh, help me understand that confusing article in the union from last September. The union ran a front page article with a big headline that said, will the real local Indians please stand up? It was a disaster of journalism, <laughs> a disaster of history, a disaster of fact. Um, it quoted Shelley. They didn't interview Shelley for the story. They used quotes from an interview on another story from how many years prior? All, they they got a they got a file of quotes they've gotten from Shelley from stories in the past and they pulled from that and made it sound as though they had interviewed her for the article. Um, it talks about three sort of entities. One is the Nevada City Rancher and Nisanon Tribe. One is the Chayaka Maidu Tribe, Don Ryberg Chairman, and the third is Rose Enos and her family. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and give my perspective on this, okay? Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon Tribe. Uh, most of the four and a half years of work I've done has been to research the history through legal documents. And what I found is that a Nisanon ancestor was a signatory to the 1851 Camp Union Treaty that promised a reservation to the Nisanon from the Bear River to the Yuba River. Something like 12 square miles, I think. Um, all the other, like all the other treaties in California, the treaties went back to Washington, DC. They don't take effect until they're ratified by the US Senate under our constitution. And the California congressional delegation lobbied against Senate ratification and prevailed. And the, all the California treaties went into the Senate vaults unratified. And they were not, um, they were not made, that wasn't made public until something like 1904. So for like half a century or more, the, the unratified treaties lay in the Senate vaults with nobody knowing that they were not ratified. All the Indian people, all the tribes in California that signed those treaties thought they had a treaty with the United States of America. So you hear about broken treaties in Indian country. We didn't even get to the point of being able to have a broken treaty because the treaty never got ratified in the first place. In 1878, there was uh, an individual allotment of federal Indian land to Chief uh, Charlie Culley, 75 acres on Cement Hill. In 1913, President Woodrow Wilson issued an executive order setting that land aside as a reservation for the tribe, for the residents of that 75 acres and recognizing that conferred federal recognition on the tribe. In 1935, there was an election supervised by the Secretary of Interior. BIA official from Sacramento came out to the reservation, took a roll of the adults living there and prepared a voter roll as the federal statute that they were operating under provided. And there was an election and the tribe voted to organize as a tribe under a federal statute called the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. So we have the voter roll certified by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We know who's on that list. There were 18 eligible voters listed. Not everybody who was a tribal member was there the day that the federal agent came out. Some people left to find work down in the valley, seasonal work was really common as a way to try to earn a living. So there were members of the tribe who had residences there, but who were not on the list. But we know who the people who, who are on the list. 
okay? Um, in 1958, Congress passed the California Rancheria Act, which allowed for the sale of Indian land and the termination of Indian tribes. And prerequisite to those events were a long list of federal benefits, job training, education, sewer, water, roads, everything brought up to code so that when the land came out of federal trust and became fee land that the county would have jurisdiction over, they wouldn't be immediately forfeited for not complying with code. The federal government, um, <laughs> the Bureau of Indian Affairs made a deal with the Senate Indian Affairs Committee that um, they would not request appropriation of any money to fulfill those prerequisites if they pass the statute. We have a deposition transcript of a BIA official who participated in those negotiations in 1958. BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, none of the tribes got any of those benefits that were express prerequisites to the sale of their land and the termination of their tribes. And they were terminated anyway, and the land was sold anyway. Um, so Nevada City Rancheria was sold in 1964 on the vote of two members only. None of the other tribal members were got notice. None of them participated in voting to approve the sale of land. That's what happened. It took uh, five years because there were mining claims that the government had to clear up on the chain of title. So it was sold in 64. The government has treated the sale of that land in 64 as termination of the tribe. And um, I don't think that that's correct legally. And I, in, after we um, complete this homeland return, then the next project is to go back to what I was doing before, which was um, developing strategy and, and evidence to, for a lawsuit to try to get the tribe's recognition restored. In 1979, California Indian Legal Services filed a class action lawsuit challenging the illegal terminations, and the government settled. And Nevada City Rancheria was a named plaintiff in that lawsuit. In 1983, there was a stipulated judgment. The government and the lawyers for CILS, California Indian Legal Services, reached an agreement, restored the recognition of all these tribes that were illegally terminated. Nevada City Rancheria was left off of the judgment by clerical error. In 2010, the tribe hired a law firm in Sacramento that filed a, a motion to amend the judgment, to correct the judgment and add Nevada City Rancheria back into that judgment. The government, for the first time, raised the statute of limitations as a defense and prevailed. The federal court dismissed the case and the Ninth Circuit affirmed. Um, so that's the history of Nevada City Rancheria. And I will say, well, I'll get to that. Uh, okay. What about the Chiacum? When I moved here, you know, all I heard about was Don Ryberg as the chairman of the Chiacum Maidu tribe. And, uh, you know, there was a um, lot of support in the community. He was, you know, seeking support. I know people who took Maidu language classes. I know, um, I know of a church congregation, maybe this one, that discussed and voted on a resolution of support. I know of someone who stood up and said, has anyone actually researched the history of this? And maybe a congregation didn't listen to somebody that said that. <laughs> I think Lindsay was here maybe then. I don't know if you remember that or not. Am I embellishing at all or is that pretty accurate, right? Yeah. This is, oh, you guys haven't heard this. So, you know, and, but once I had the space in my, the brain space and the time in my life to actually do the research, it's very, very clear. The story of the Chayaka Maidu tribe, they were federally recognized at the Taylorsville Rancheria. Where's that? It's in Plumas County, 
It's northeast of the town of Quincy. They have a pending lawsuit in federal court as we speak today, trying to get their federal recognition restored at the Taylorsville Rancheria in Plumas County. So how, why, motivations, intentional, unintentional, I don't know why there would be disinformation around that. The record, the documents are crystal clear <laughs> about that. Sounded like I whacked the mic. Um, and I just want to say, kind of as a tangent to that, that just as there are many levels and ways of understanding, you know, the history of John Woolman and the property and looking at it from Chirp's point of view or looking at it from the point of view of alumni of Woolman School, there's also different ways of looking at tribes, at, at um, you know, um, indigenous people, their history, their language, their culture, their religious practices. I look at it from a legal point of view because I'm a lawyer, right? So I don't know very much about native languages. I don't know very much about um, native spiritual practices. I do know that every tribe that I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot of them in California, federally recognized tribes, almost every single member is eligible for enrollment at more than one tribe. We, let me back up. The gold rush caused a genocide. Other places in the country, the settler colonial movement west picked up tribes whole and moved them onto reservations, the Trail of Tears, and you've heard all those stories, right? California didn't have time for that. There was a genocide here, and there's a book by, there's a historian at UCLA, Benjamin Madley, that's written a phenomenal book about the California genocide, and I highly recommend it. Um, as a consequence of that, tribes here were blown apart. And the Indian people, particularly in this area, the Indian people who survived were the ones that hid. If you kept your head down and didn't, weren't visible, you stood a chance of surviving. And I think it's important to remember that, to understand that. Um, it, it's not that long ago. It's not that long ago. And um, my, my father-in-law was a Holocaust survivor from Germany, he fled after Kristallnacht in 38. Those traumas stay with you. <laughs> they do, they stay with you. Okay, um, and, and I think that may, so, so, so were there Maidu people that were in this area pre-contact? Probably, there was probably trade that went on. Shelley knows a lot more about this than I do. But my question is, what tribe was federally recognized here? It's a, pol it, it's a political classification. An Indian tribe is a government. Its members are its citizens. Um, my, my wife and kids are eligible for citizenship in the United States, but also in Germany because my father-in-law was German and fled the Holocaust. So Germany as part of its reparations has made citizenship available to survivors. There are people enrolled in federally recognized tribes that could be enrolled at another federally recognized tribe. It's not, so the questions of ancestry, language, culture, spiritual, spiritual practices, all those are really important. They're not determinative of who's a member of a tribe. It's a, it's, are you a citizen of the United States? Well, there's criteria, and if you apply and you meet the criteria, then you're a citizen, right? Um, so, so that's kind of about the track. And then the Rose Enos, there, there are folks uh, in the community, descendants of hers. Um, she's a, she's a Nisanon elder. She and all of her lineal descendants are absolutely eligible for enrollment at the Nevada City Rancheria tribe. Rose Enos and her daughter Wanda Bachelor are, at my understanding is, and I haven't verified, I have not seen the paperwork on this, but I understand are enrolled at the Washoe tribe of Nevada. 
with whom the Nisanan traded over the, over the mountains. That's a federally recognized tribe. They have all the benefits of all federal government programs for Indians and Indian tribes flow to federally recognized tribes. You can't, you cannot, unlike uh, dual citizenship, US and Germany, you cannot be enrolled in two tribes at the same time. Every tribal constitution I've ever seen, the enrollment criteria include you're not enrolled at another tribe. So you have to pick one. So for somebody to relinquish enrollment in a federally recognized tribe where they get benefits in order to enroll in a tribe that's not federally recognized with no material benefits doesn't make any sense. So part of the disinformation that I've seen is that somehow the Nevada City Rancheria you know, has, has shunned Rosie and Osa. It's, it's the, the opposite is true. They, would, they welcome them, they recognize them as, as being um, uh, descendants, they recognize them as eligible for enrollment, and if they submitted an enrollment application, they'd be in, in the paperwork, which everybody has to do, which is like birth certificates and death certificates and marriage certificates to show, you know, your family line, they'd be enrolled. It's just that simple. <laughs> um, so uh, that's that, the union article. Uh, how many tribal members are there? I get this question a lot. Um, again, what message does that question send? I think what it, sent, what it sends to me is that there's an implicit assumption that if, if there's over a certain number of tribal members, there's somehow that confers legitimacy. But if there's under a certain number, that takes away legitimacy. And I just want to say that is a false assumption. It's a false assumption. There are federally recognized tribes that have fewer than 10 members. In California, the Weapai, I'll name names, the Weapai tribe in Southern California has less than 10 members. There was a, a tribe out near the Salton Sea, east and south of Palm Springs that had one or two members, federally recognized tribe. The number of members does not confer or take away the legitimacy of the tribal government. And to ask that question of a people who have been the victims of genocide, <laughs> um, it makes me do this <laughs> a little bit. So I understand the question. I understand, I think, why people ask it. It's a genuine curiosity. And I will say this. Part of both of these dynamics, I think, the last one I was talking about and this one, is that Shelley Covert has somehow found the courage to stand up publicly and be the spokesperson. Yeah, yes. And, but, but, but remember what I said. If you stood up visibly and said, I'm I'm a Native American and I'm proud. Oh, now I know who to shoot and get and collect my bounty from the militia. The state of California paid bounties for people for, for killing Indian people here, here. The, the, the governor of California state of the state address to the legislature 1851 and 1852, read them, read them. The extermination of the Indian race is the most important priority for the state of California. The governor of this state in the state of the state address to the legislature, that was the biggest problem California was facing in 1852. Okay, so how, so that, and that, that knowledge gets passed down, right? We all learn in our families, we have family culture. We learn things from our parents and our grandparents whether we want to or not. <laughs> And if one of the things you learn is that your survival depends on being quiet and invisible, otherwise you could be killed. Otherwise in, in the 50s, all or most of the children of tribal members were taken away without the parents' consent for, to boarding schools and to foster homes. So visibility, speaking up, identifying yourself was the wrong thing to do was very, very dangerous. So people see Shelley and they say, well, is she the only tribal member? What is that question? How is that question received, right? By tribal members, like, oh. Um, nobody likes to get up in front of a 
group of people and talk, myself included, right? Public speaking and whatever is like, it's one of our biggest fears, right? It's hard to do. I don't have a, any family legacy of if, you, if, you, if you're visible, it's dangerous. You could get killed or your kids taken away. I have none of that. It's still hard, right? Um, all right. But um, there are about 150 Nisanan people who are um, descended from the original federally recognized tribe. And how do I know that? Because we've done the work, we've done the research. We spent the first two years gathering documents, which is a, pro a difficult process to do. Why? Because it's dangerous. It's dangerous for me to give you my marriage certificate, a copy of my grandfather's birth certificate, right? There's a, on a cellular level, it's, it's dangerous to do that. So that we went through a long process of building trust the last thing any Indian person wants to see is some white guy lawyer coming around saying, oh, I'm here to help you. <laughs> that did not end well historically, <laughs> right? So it's been a slow process, but we, um, we have an incredible ally, Professor Brian Daniels is a professor of anthropology and archaeology at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the research director at the Penn Cultural Heritage Center. And he works globally on issues of cultural heritage and cultural preservation in conflict zones. So Ukraine, Syria, Afghanistan, who's protecting the galleries, who's protecting the museums. That's what Brian's, one of his main day jobs is. But he's from Northern California and he's long been interested in the plight of the unrecognized and illegally terminated tribes of Northern California. He has graduate students. <laughs> so, so we, we build trust, we collect, we collect records, birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, um, affidavits of Indian sen census. There was a 1928 California Indian census, declarations under penalty of perjury, who your parents were, what tribe you're affiliated with, who your kids are, all this stuff. We collect it all, we scanned it all. Now it's in the cloud, so it can't get eaten by rodents or burned up in a fire. Um, Brian and his graduate students have meticulously gone through the records, starting with the 1935 voter roll, those 18 names, and built a genealogy of the tribe. We have a Nevada City Rancheria membership document. It is 1,371 pages long. And we, tra we can, tra every me tribal member today, we can trace back their lineage to the members in 1935. We have the records. We have the genealogy done in the way that the Bureau of Indian Affairs wants Indian genealogy done. So we've done the work. We know who the tribal members are. And that's why I can say Rosie Enos is absolutely eligible for enrollment. If she wants to give up all of her Washoe benefits and enroll at Nevada City, she, no problem. And the same for her lineal descendants. Um, okay, I think that that was my list. Um, how are we doing on time, Kevin? So maybe a good time to transition to questions, other questions. Thank you. you can see why we wanted to have Frank have an opportunity to speak to you, right? So I was, I was, not, I was watching the chat, and many of the questions were answered. There's one about support. Let's hang on to that one for a moment. But what, what questions are still remaining? That, was a, that covered a lot of the questions people had in mind and heart. I invite you to take a breath and ask yourself, and I'm asking this from a tradition that we joke about ourselves that a question often begins, this is more of a statement than a question, <laughs> right? So what, what are your genuine questions that are remaining? It really would help you to know, it might help other people to know.
That was one of the questions. Would you repeat the question enough? To... Yeah, I, I think the, the question is um, from, from a Woolman alumni and um, staff. staff alumni um, uh, that he understands that there are certain contingencies in the sale agreement that are supposed to remain confidential and that maybe if they weren't confidential, that would somehow be of assistance in understanding more about what's going on. Is that fair? Okay, um, the Woolen Board asked Chirp to not publicly state the purchase price for their own reasons. So I would, uh, and Chirp has done our best to honor that request. What I will say and what we have said publicly is that we have a fundraising campaign. Our first in two phases. The first phase is $1.5 million. That's enough money to cover, to close escrow, so the purchase price, plus an additional increment because there's going to be a lot of work that has to be done that's going to cost money. There's going to be a lot of dollars that have to be spent as part of the process of getting county approval to, to do anything other than have a farm. And then the second increment is a $900,000 increment, and that CHIRP is viewing as essentially a, uh, an endowment to have funds there for ongoing operating costs. So to address the question of, well, how are you going to keep the doors open? How are you going to pay the insurance and the taxes and all that kind of stuff? So um, the contingencies, you know, in a real estate transaction, when you're, when you're the buyer, uh, you, you have a period of time to investigate the property. And typically you'll hire a, a building inspector to come out and look, how's the foundation? How's the roof? Do the toilets flush? Uh, is the well water drinkable? Uh, you know, whatever, are there termites? Is there dry rot in the deck? All those kinds of things. So those are the contingencies that I was referring to um, that CHIRP right now has through April 4th to release. So we're working hard. There's a lot to do out there. Is that helpful? Yeah. Brian, thank you for the question. That was also a question online. Others? What is the relationship of the colony Indian tribe to Nisanan tribe? I don't, I don't know who the, what the colony. Yeah, so so the 1913 executive order from President Woodrow Wilson uses that word colony. So in um, what uh, and the land was set aside for the residents, the people living there. That's who the land was set aside for. The term doesn't doesn't matter. Has no legal significance. Colony, band, rancheria, tribe, pueblo, they all mean the same thing. The same with the land, reservation. People ask me, what's the difference between a rancheria and a reservation? They're spelled differently, but they mean, the, <laughs> legally, they mean the same thing. Uh, a Pueblo in New Mexico, they call them Pueblos, right? It, it, they're all the same thing. Land set aside for the benefit of Indians owned by the United States of America in trust for those Indians is federal Indian land. And it gets called by different names in different places, reservation, rancheria, Pueblo, individual Indian allotments like Chief Cullies back in 1878. There can be individual Indian land also, but collective Indian land is, is those, goes by all those names and, co and colony, tribe, band, rancheria, all those names also get applied to the name of the government, the tribal political entity that is the tribal government. How is the Woolman Farm situated in the 75.48 acres of federal land? 
given was given to the colony tribe in the 1913 legislation. How was the Woolman farmed? Well, the 75.48 acres was on Cement Hill. And won't, so from Cement Hill, you come down to 49 and you turn right and you head towards the river. And then on Newtown Road at the Willow Restaurant, you turn left and you go down Newtown Road, almost all the way down. And then you turn right on Jones Bar Road and you go out Jones Bar Road about three quarters of a mile. And then there's John Woolman Lane. So there, and my house is in between. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, can I please interrupt um, from Zoom at some point? Yeah. Uh, yes, what's what's unanswered on Zoom, Beth? Uh, there's a question for Frank, came in uh, as a text to me from someone who's on the phone. Um, would it be legal for Woolman to transfer its assets to Chirp under California nonprofit law instead of selling? And how would that work? Would that hurt the tribe in any way? And would it help? Well, it would obviously it would help tremendously. And, you know, what the Woolman board has told us is that they have debts. They, you know, Woolman has um, benefited from charitable donations, mostly from Quaker individuals and family trusts over many, many years to keep the doors open. And they have a, a in some cases, a legal obligation. And in all cases, they feel a moral obligation to repay those debts. So that's part of the equation. Uh, I mentioned before that the California Attorney General's Office reviews a nonprofit's sale of it all or most of its assets. That process is ongoing. It's, I've never done an application like that. And I don't know the lawyers at the AG's office that process them. I don't know what their office culture is around them. I've, I know what the statute says, and it's not very helpful. <laughs> It's to ensure that the public benefit is being served or continued to be served by the transfer of the assets. So how would the Attorney General's office view a donation of the land as opposed to a sale of land? I, you know, I, I just have no idea. But it would sure help chirp a lot. Because <laughs> every dollar we've raised, we, we're going to need for all kinds of things that need to happen out there. Yeah, this, the 75 acres is on Polk Street. That's, as I believe, the local board is, but that was Chief Kelly, and that's where the uh, co-housing is now. And he's no. saying, talk about Chief Kelly. Two, yeah, two different people. This is, a, this is uh, why don't you ask Shelley afterwards and she can <laughs> give you the, the detail, the nitty gritty. But, Shelley was with the Downs, um, about a mile, two miles away from there. Right. Where a co-housing is, is on this side of 49, on the town side of 49, and the 75 acres was on the uphill side of, uh, up on Cement Hill. And yeah. Hi, Beth here. A reminder that we Hi. on Zoom cannot hear anything unless it's spoken into a microphone. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Yes, we're just about to say. So this is a question about pieces of property and two names, Cully and Kelly. Right. Different right. people, different times, different places. Kelly lived and took care of the Nevada City dump and lived there a, couple, a mile or two away from, the, from where the rancheria was. Cully was Chief Cully in the 1800s, who had an individual allotment of Indian land, federal land for his interest, for his personal benefit, but the tribe lived there. He, he, he wasn't the only one living there. And then in 1913, that land was converted from an individual allotment to a tribal allotment, if that makes not an allotment, but a, you know, a, a rancheria. Another question here. Yeah. I'll repeat it. Is 
how much work it takes, and that most land back deals give back interest rates and the price and so cheap that you get them here. And I would hope we don't have to make a decision right now. And I don't know if it's working and I'm not even asked this. I have to figure that out myself. But can we please have some sort of restriction? Well, so that was, yeah, so more of a statement, right? You're, you're here's a person very deeply connected to the land and its history through your family, and you, you're hoping that there'll be some open space protected that is really important to you. So that was, that was the message you were sharing. Yes, understood. And you, you heard what I said that, you know, Woolman had conversations with Bear Yuba Land Trust. I mean, the way that's typically done is a conservation easement. And Woolman explored that with Bear Yuba Land Trust over, I think, a period of years. And we've, I've had conversations with the executive director of the Bear Yuba Land Trust about this issue. And what she said to me was, we've looked at it very carefully and it's not appropriate for a conservation easement. That's what they're saying. But what I would say is, you know, that the, the Woolman institution highly valued um, had environmental values, right? Preservation of the environment and so on. I, I would just encourage everybody to see that the tribe does too. <laughs> the tribe care took that land for 10,000 years. They, 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 they were the caretakers of the land. They lived in harmony with the land for 10,000 years before European contact. So have a little faith. Ha the John Hyatt song, have a little faith in me. <laughs> Yeah. That just feels important. Yeah. As just like what they've already been up to. So the the comment is is that the that Chirp's website and the and the FAQs that just are, went up this week address this issue also, and and that the tribe um, th there was a question about other land I think that that's addressed there too. Um, the Sierra Fund wrote a grant proposal, got some state funding, and some land down on Deer Creek was acquired by the Sierra Fund, I think, and then donated to CHIRP if I've got the, I wasn't involved in that, but that's my understanding. There were, it's a toxic waste dump, that land, and it's steep and there's no access to it. It's, and, but the tribe has been working to try to help clean it up. And that approach and relationship to the land, you saw the video, I mean, that's, that's at the heart of what the tribal leaders um, envision. So uh, that's what I say about that. Yes, a multi-part question that I think is connected. Who is the Bureau of Indian Affairs? Who's on its staff? What kind of what kind of group are they? Are they using more of them? And then what are the benefits that you get from recognition? <laughs> what do you try to get if they become recognized? What kind of benefits do their members get? Yeah, so the Bureau of Indian Affairs is an agency of the United States government within the Department of Interior. Uh, <laughs> It has a reputation of being not the most uh, customer friendly of federal aid. I don't know if there are any federal agencies that are super customer friendly. It's a challenging agency to deal with. Very challenging agency. Uh, well, you know, people are all excited. We have the Secretary of Interior, Deb Hallen, is an indigenous woman. Uh, first time in the history of this country. The head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the position is the Assistant Secretary of Interior for Indian Affairs. That's the head of the BIA. His name is Brian Newland. He's an, a native person and a lawyer. He represented tribes. So people say, well, can't they just right all these historical wrongs and stroke of the pen and recognize the tribe? And uh, we've asked. They haven't answered yet, <laughs> or their answer has been, no, <laughs> basically. Uh, the second question was, what benefits flow? What's the consequence of federal recognition? F the federal government, as a 
by, by Supreme Court decisions starting in the 1820s ha has held that the United States government is in the role of trustee and fiduciary with respect to Indian people and Indian tribes as a consequence of military conquest. Indians and Indian tribes are wards of the state if you read the Supreme Court from 1825 and so on, whole series of Supreme Court decisions. So what's developed is a trust doctrine. So the land, when you look at the deed to your, to my house, it says Frank Lawrence and Renee Wildman and community property in fee. If you look at the deed to an Indian reservation or a rancheria, it says owned by the United States government in trust for the benefit of the blank Indian tribe. So it's a trust relationship. There's an entire title of the United States Code, Title 25 of the US Code, says in the old days when you had a law library of books instead of you know online or whatever, the book, the spine of the book says 25 Indians. That's the name of Title 25 of the US Code. There's one, all the federal criminal codes in one title, all the tax codes in another title, and all the Indian laws are in a, in a title by themselves. The government has programs that support tribal governments. There's money for tribal governmental operations. There's funding for housing, education, infrastructure, cultural preservation, environmental protection. Federally recognized tribes can be their own environmental protection agency. What the EPA does in monitoring air and water quality, Indian tribes do. I have clients that have EPA monitoring status. The whole world opens up in terms of what the amount of support that's available financially and otherwise. There's money for energy, for alternative energy projects, um, commercial, I mean, like big scale alternative energy projects. The li I can't even, it's overwhelming to me to even try to think about that. But um, it, it, it's night and day. I, I don't know how else to describe it. The unrecognized tribes have nothing and get nothing. And the recognized tribes have an entire universe open to them of federal programs that are available. Yeah, so the question is, um, Daniel Ketchum, I um, appreciate the question, and I, um, uh, the question is that the Nevada City Rancheria, is the Nevada City Rancheria an entity? Does it have any structure to it today? And the answer is yes. The tribe has a constitution, a founding document, a constitution that, like most tribes, not all tribes, uh, there are tribes that are custom and tradition tribes. They have no foundational document. Some tribes have what's called articles of association, as if they were a corporation. Most tribes have a constitution, and it sets out who, who the, how, how mem you know, what the membership criteria is, how, how the leadership is structured. So the tribe does exist as a tribal government. It's not federally recognized. It has been recognized and supported by unanimous resolutions of the Nevada City Council, the Grass Valley City Council, the Nevada County Board of Supervisors, the Nevada County Historical Society. It's not true? Well, I have a, I have a copy of a letter saying that. Well, we, we, we'll talk. Yeah, I'd love to go over the documents in that um, file from the historical site. I think I've seen your name associated with it. That's why I mentioned it. Oh, I, I wasn't done, Daniel. Uh, and, the, and the state of California also through the Native American Heritage Commission. The Native American Heritage Commission consists of uh, gubernatorial appointees who are charged with implementing uh, state law. Um, I think it's AB 52 and SB 8 or something, or maybe I got, I think that's right, um, which amended the California Environmental Quality Act we call it CEQA, right, which requires when there's a government permit for any kind of project, it requires there be an environmental review. 
what are the environmental impacts? So we just went through this with the mine project, right? The big environmental review. That's a CEQA project. Okay. State law says that Indian tribes are entitled to be consulted when there's a CEQA project in their territory. And by state law, the Native American Heritage Commission can list on its list for consultation purposes, both federally recognized tribes, but also tribes that are not federally recognized. So the commission has a list of criteria, regulatory criteria for listing. And uh, one of the things that we've done in the time I've been working with the tribe is to put together an application. And we did, um, ex very lengthy, <laughs> very extensive. The 1,371 page enrollment document was just one exhibit. There were, I don't know, I, I lost track now of how many exhibits. And the commission has recognized the tribe. So city, city, county, apparently not the historical society, but I, we got we, we to gotta look at those documents and the state. So um, I, I would say the answer to your question, Daniel, is the tribe does, does have a structure. They, they have tribal meetings, they have elections, they have a tribal council as set forth in the constitution. They're duly elected by the members and it, it operates uh, with all, within all that structure. Yes. So the yeah. Yes. Understood. So the question is, uh, I would reframe it as, what's the relationship between the Nevada City Ranchery and Nissanon Tribe as a tribal government? and CHIRP as a nonprofit corporation. So um, they are different entities. CHIRP is a tribally directed nonprofit. So CHIRP's board has both tribal leaders from the tribal council on its board, and it has non-Nisanon community members on its board. The non-Nisanon board members understand and view their role as furthering CHIRP's mission, which is to support the Nisanon people in this community. So I, um, they do get used interchangeably because they're very, very tightly connected, but they are separate entities legally. So CHIRP is a California nonprofit benefit corporation, 501c3, and the tribe is a tribal government that's not federally recognized, but state, county, city recognized. Um, and uh, so I think anybody that is interested in finding out uh, at a more micro level the details of the relationship between the tribal government and the nonprofit need to just ask. <laughs> and the sale of the and, property is to? And the sale of the property is to CHIRP. Because, because it's a nonprofit corporation, and Woolman is a non, and we do the same with Woolman, I'll just point out. It's College Park Friends Educational Association. They dropped the ink, it used to be ink, right? And on the deeds, actually, there were some, some minor differences in how the name appeared. But we also call it the John Woolman School. We also call it the Woolman at Sierra Friends Center. We also call it the, the Quaker School out there off of Jones Bar. We also call it Woolman, right? We, this is how people talk. And you, um, as a historian and uh, <clears throat> a professional appraiser, uh, and me as a lawyer, we pay attention to those fine nuances and details. But for most people, they have a, I think they have an, a correct understanding of that, that CHIRP and the tribe are really um, operating in support of each other and very, very closely aligned. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's five o'clock, Kevin says. It's actually 5.02. <laughs> we ran over. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.